I'm supposed to be wired up so that you all can hear me. And tonight is a special night for me. I look back over the years and I find that Wednesday night is supposed to be a night of prayer for the church. And I think back as we study the scriptures, how prayer played such a part in the Gospels. How the Lord Jesus Christ, in the middle of the night, got up and went out by himself to pray. And how the disciples came to the Lord and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That when you pray, you pray this way. That was a sample prayer. And I think about Wednesday night, how we used to do it. How our church would be full. And the ladies would get on one side of the church and the men on the other side of the church. And we could be on our knees, those of, the, those of us that could. And we cry out to God. Prayer is the power that we have. And we don't use it. It's very difficult for me to pray over five minutes if I pray that long. And I know that there are many people that pray longer than that. But without prayer, our churches are stagnant. Our churches do not move. And we don't move. The things that we really want and that we really pray for and the many times that we spend at night or during the day talking to the Lord and asking the Lord to do certain things for us. And yet, we don't want to get on our knees to glorify Him. If we look at prayer as it is taught in the scriptures and how Jesus practiced it. That was always his concern was our Father, God, to be glorified in him. Glorify me, Lord, so that I can glorify you. Answer my prayers. So prayer on Wednesday nights, our churches call it prayer meeting. Now I know that your heart is the most important thing to God. And he knows it whether we know it or not. He is in you through your heart, and he knows your heart whether it is dedicated to him, whether it is seeking him, or we're looking to him to help us in many ways that the world wants us to go. Tonight, I'm, I got off on the, on the wrong foot, I guess, because I didn't, I, I didn't intend to do this. My text tonight, as I was going over different things to think about, there's one of the things that we talk about in our churches is the rapture of the church and how we're all looking forward to it, I believe. There may be some of us here who do not want to see the rapture come just now. We may want to see our little ones grow up. 
we may want to see other things. We may want to accomplish something for ourselves. So we don't want the rapture to come just now. But the rapture of the church, and that is the purpose that Jesus had when he said that upon this rock, me, I will build my church. And upon that rock stands the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. And so, when we think about the rapture, the rap word rapture is not in the Bible at all, and the, we take the word from rapture, which is Latin, for called out ones. Called out, called up, used. And so tonight, we take, I take my text from Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I may not reach 7, but I'm going to start with, with verse 1 and verse 2 anyway. So I've asked Brother Pope if he would read from the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was set, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a round rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And that was the end of, of verse 7. John, the Apostle John, as we, I'm certain that all of us have read the book of Revelation, and that we started at the beginning where John was called up and chosen on the Spirit to be the one to bring to us those things that are going to happen. Now, one of the things that I find in my life and in your life is we would love to know what's going to happen tomorrow. We would love to know what's going to happen a year from now. But we don't know. The only thing that we can see is what we have now. And John had just come through chapter 1, Chapter 2, chapter 3, and now in chapter 4, he says, after these things, I began to wonder, after these things, what? And I got to thinking about my life, a very short life, but the things that have changed and taken place in this world just in the short period of time that I've been here. When I think back to when I was a boy and our little village that we had, I don't believe that anyone ever locked their doors. 
And I know that the three churches in our little village had horse barns in back of the churches so that people could park their horses while they went in for service. And I remember watering troughs. We don't have those anymore. Watering troughs through the village. And then radio and television. And I remember back in the early 30s, 1930 or 31, that my father signed up, signed me up for a National Radio Institute uh, program to learn radio. And one of the books that I got predicted that you'd be able to see pictures come over the air. Never heard of anything like that. Yet in Revelation 4, verse 1, is after these things. Then a little bit later on, we see knowledge increase so fast and so rapidly. Last year, for instance, look at all of the electronics, the games, the boards, the cameras, those things that we're looking at, and how the computer has taken over and the computer science is now to such an extent that it is going to control the lives of every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of this earth. Now you look at what you're doing now. You look at the type of money that you're using. Plastic? Yes. It's a number? Yes. And it's going to come to the point where we're not going to be able to buy or sell or work without a number. Now it's starting. It's easy. And we're going into it and saying, hey, this is, the, this is really the way to go. But it is not. After these things, I remember back in the 1928 and 1929 that the divorce rate in the United States of America was one divorce for every 20 marriages. And today, it is one out of every two, an increase. Back then, the crime rate was low. I remember in our village, we had a constable, but that's all it was, it was just a name. There was no nothing I don't ever recall of anybody ever being arrested. But the crime rate has increased since 1930 until the present time, over 1,100%. Every day on TV, you see and you hear of shootings, of stabbings, of murders, and we're trying to outlaw guns But why not outlaw automobiles? They kill more people than guns do. So, after these things, John was in the spirit on the Lord's Day on the Isle of Patmos. And he heard this voice, and he looked up, and he saw a door opened into heaven, and a voice speaking to him, and saying, come up hither, and I will show thee things that must shortly come to pass. 
So it was after these things. And if we go to the first chapter of Revelation, we find that the first thing was that there was a three-part series in chapters 1, verse 19, who said to, for John to write the things that he saw, write the things that are, and to write the things that will shortly come to pass. It was after all of these things. So the first thing in chapter 1 that he saw was the glorified Lord. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet as dead. He didn't see Jesus as the Savior. He saw J Jesus as the super. He was supreme. He was over everything. He didn't see Jesus the way he was on earth. But he saw a glorified Jesus, one who was in charge of everything, the heavens, the earth, and all of the people. So he wrote that down. And the next thing he saw, and you must remember, that this was a vision that John had while he was on the Isle of Patmos. Now the next thing that he saw was that Le Jesus had seven letters to seven representative churches. And those churches represented all of the churches all through the, the world, all through the full age of the world. This church, was there. And if you look at those letters carefully, you can almost find out and say, well, hey, this represents that church over there. That's what I heard about that. And this represents our church. These are the things that the Lord had John write. So now after those things, those are the things we're in the church age now. And the church age is going to come to a close. And we wonder when the rapture is going to take place. Is the, ra is the church going to go through the tribulation? Beginning with chapter 4, on through chapter 22, there's no more mention of the church. The church, as far as the book of Revelation is concerned, is no longer in existence. I believe that as you read it, that you find the rapture of the church is indicated in John because he was translated immediately in the spirit into heaven into the place that we want to be, into the place where we look forward to being. But the one thing, the rapture cannot take place until certain things come to pass. And when we go to Matthew ch chapter 24 and read there about the flood, the deluge that came upon the world to eliminate the sin that was in the world. And now we look at what we've got today, the sin that is in the world. And you look at the weather. You look at the things that are happening. You look at all of these things because you know that God is in control of all of these activities. God is not, has been legislated out of the United States. The Holy Spirit is not a restraining spirit anymore because we're left on our own. Whatever you want to do, go ahead and do it. 
And that is exactly what is taking place today. We listen to the news and shudder, and I, I listen to the news every morning and every evening if I can. And I'm trying to think about God. In the book of Esther, God is not present in that whole book because these people, the Jews, did not want to leave Babylon and go back to Jerusalem with a remnant to rebuild the city and the temple and restore the worship unto God. These people were too happy with the situation they were in. They were making money. They had a good life. Everything was going well for them. But God had withdrawn the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was with the remnant in Jerusalem. And we find the same thing here in America today. We're happy with our life. We want it to come back. We pray, O oh Lord, restore to us thy spirit. And we want to come back to pre-9-11, But pre-9-11, we were happy as anything could be, making money. And we didn't need the church. We didn't need God. We had money. And then 9-11 happened. And for a short period of time, people turned back to God. But now they're, they're away. And we look for money when we go to the polls to vote. We don't want to vote the right way. We want to vote the way we think that we're going to get the most out of our Social Security, our welfare checks. We're, we're conscious of those rather than looking for the Spirit of God in our lives. You know, there's many times in your life that you have cried out to God for help for either you or your children or your loved ones. And we have cried out to God and sometimes God has answered your prayers, but most of the time, listen to me, how many of you tonight can stand up and say, God has richly blessed me. He has answered my prayer 100%. I don't believe many of us can do that. But that is possible. My brothers and sisters, it is possible because God has given to us the church, the power of prayer, the power of prayer. I've said it before, you don't go any farther than you go on your knees. And John realized that because he was in the spirit. He was thinking about Jesus. He was thinking about heaven. And he saw a door opened in heaven and heard a voice saying, Come up hither, and I will show thee things that will shortly come to pass. And so up from that point on, things were going to happen. As we go down in that scripture, I can't complete it all tonight. I would love to, but as we go down in the scripture, we find in, in the fifth verse that it says there is thunderings from the throne of God, there is lightnings, there is voices, 
And I believe that about 95% of the population in America today have a feeling down in their gut, down in their hearts, that something unusual is going to be happening. I believe that they feel that. And you know, when you go to Matthew 24 and verse 35, 36, you find that God was about to destroy the earth by a flood because of the sin that was in the world. And it was out of that flood that came the emerald rainbow around the throne of God. But God destroyed the world and only Noah and his family were saved. Only that, only those eight souls. Millions drowned, disappeared, but will be back. Those same millions are going to be back. And this is the one thing that God is getting ready to pour out his wrath upon this world. And if you study the book of Revelation, you'll find that beginning with chapter 6 through 19, the first from 6 to 11 is three and a half years of the great tribulation. Now, some people have called it the wrath of God and so on and so forth. It is not. You read it carefully and prayerfully, and you find those three and a half years is the great tribulation brought about by the satanic influence upon the earth. That's when the man of sin appears. That's when Jesus said that when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then, then comes the great tribulation. And if you study your Bibles, which you should, you will find that in, those, in that Bible, you're going to see that God has warned all of us about what he is going to do. From chapter 12 through 19 is another three and a half year period, which is the wrath of God. This is God's wrath coming upon the world, and through that is comes Satan's demise. The influence of Satan is gone. But the wrath of God against the sin of the world is horrible. There's, the church isn't there. The church has been taken out. Before the flood happened with Noah, there was, there was Adam, Seth, Enoch, Methuselah, all of these people were taken out of the world before the flood came. No blood believing Christian, I've got to say that, that between Noah and Adam were in the flood. Those who believed in Jehovah God had been taken out. Now, we're in a position today, I believe, that we're beginning to see those things that are going to come. But remember this, that the church will be taken out before 
the rapture of the church. The church, the rapture will take the church out. This is what we call the rapture. We're going to be then translated to be in heaven. We're going to be there with Christ. We're going to stand before the throne of God. We're not going to be judged because of sin in our lives. We're going to be judged because of what we have been doing since accepting Christ as our Savior. We're going to be chastised, yes. I think that it's almost time for me to quit. But what I want to say to you tonight are you going to be in the great tribulation and the wrath of God or are you going to be in heaven with the saints of God? If you are going to be in heaven with the saints, it is only because you have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And if you haven't, then tonight is the night that you can come to him and find peace for your soul and to know that you have eternal life. So we're going to, we're going to play a very short invitation hymn if we can. And I don't know what number to sing. And if I did, I wouldn't be able to sing it. So, Mike, if you'll come and lead us. But I want you to know that tonight, either here or at home, in your closet, alone with God, turn your heart over to him. Confess that you're a sinner and that you need salvation. Death is a vehicle. I'm looking forward to it because death will take me to Christ. Death will take me to heaven. Death will take me to a state of happiness. And death will take me to a reunion with my grandparents as well as Moses and Elijah. I'm looking forward to it. Brother Mike, Sing uh, page 270, Just As I Am. Just as I am. That's the way I came to the Lord, and that's the way you can come tonight, just like you are. When you are standing. Mike, I'd like to have the people sing the second verse of this song without your leading them. Just, I want to hear this congregation sing one time. So Mike, you be quiet and you listen. We're going to have the pianist play just as I am. So.
Brother Bud, would you dismiss us with prayer, please? I hear the thunder. Oh my goodness, my mic is...